Hi gang, Rob here. It is the evening of 22 June 2020 and it is time for the 22nd installment in our traditional Knives Anthology, a joint project by the Apostle P Channel and Crazy Steve from Florida, aka How About the Truth on YouTube and other social media. This 21st batch is so big I had to break it into two videos and I'm sorry it's been a few weeks since I did part one because it just wore me out. So that was video 21.0. This is going to be 21.1 for those of you who are keeping track. And this batch in its entirety, the first batch of knives not showing, <clears throat> is kind of a tribute set to Bill Howard of Great Eastern Cutlery and Derek Bone of Knives Ship Free and Northwoods Knives, the late, the great, the Derek Bone, or Bon in some circles. So, let's get to it, shall we? Let's clear the deck and we'll get to it. First up, with Moccasin. Feast your eyes on that beauty. Uh -huh. It's time to get to Steve's copy points, which are voluminous tonight. So I'm going to do my best to keep up and show you what he's talking about. You ready? <clears throat> he entitles this Northwoods Big Barlow. And here we go. I would now like to take the opportunity to pay a tribute to our late friend Derek Bone because there are two interesting stories pertaining to how I obtained the following two knives from Knives Ship Free. First up is the big Madison Barlow. Of course we've all seen this pattern in several previous videos but I guarantee you've never seen one as beautiful as this one. Hafted in the finest mammoth ivory of the entire run, this knife did come from the first ever run of Madison's. As many of you know, Derek never used a reserve system. It was a free-for-all when these knives were posted for sale on their website. I did not have the funds to purchase one when the mammoth ivory became available, so I watched the nicest ones disappear. Several days later, I finally purchased one among those that were left. I can't recall why I called them, but one of these boys there gave me a hot tip. He stated that they only received the first half of the entire run in Mammoth, as the second half were still being finished at GEC. The young man told me this was a secret and no announcements or any mention of the second shipment would be made to allow latecomers an equal opportunity to grab one. They didn't even announce the second shipment when they posted for sale. He made a deal with me. If I kept quiet, he would email me to let me know the exact date and time they would post and that he personally saw images sent from GEC showing a couple knives with the best mammoth of all. He swore that there were two knives in particular that absolutely smoked the entire run, and he was not kidding. Several of the guys working for Derek had already cherry-picked a knife from that first, two, first of two shipments. True to his word, the knives posted at 8 a.m. on a Saturday morning with no product numbers missing every single knife was available. Check out the gorgeous matching covers on this knife. Uh huh. He is not kidding guys. They are a good 25 percent thicker than the covers on any of the others. I'll put these covers up against the mammoth found on any custom knife enjoy the scenery and let's take a look 
at the rest of this knife. A beautifully polished drop point blade with a cut swedge that terminates right at the end of that long pull. Very luxurious walk and talk on this one. And I'm not going to let that drop shut because it does have the trademark of the first run of Madison Barlow's. I don't know if you can see it, but I'm sure my thumbnail can find it. There it is. They almost all had blade wrap. And this one's no exception. I kind of like that Steve hasn't had me sharpen it out because it's kind of, uh, as I said, the trademark of the first run. So I don't know if the the kicks were ground too short or if the spring is just stronger than anticipated, but the back spring on most slip joints, this one included, does a little peak right at this rivet. And that peak, if you shut the knife, if you let it snap shut, the cutting edge will contact that back spring. About one sharpening for most of these, and that goes away. But this one has it. Who cares? I mean, really, who cares? This is a pr literally priceless piece of history. Absolutely priceless. And no, it's not for sale, guys. Okay, next up. Next up. This is interesting, I think. <laughs> this is the Northwoods Willamette Half Whittler with Mammoth Ivory. I think it's interesting that Steve sent it to me, not in a knife ship free slip, but a collector knife slip. Of course, collector knives owned by Mike Latham, the arch nemesis of Derek Bone. Just kidding. They, they actually were quite good friends. Okay, back to Steve. Perhaps a year prior to the release of the Madisons, I had received yet another hot tip from yet a yo another young man working for Derek. I had just mentioned cherry picking moments ago for two reasons. One we already discussed, but the other is a tip I used to swoop on at least two other Northwoods knives made by GEC. And here's one of the two. This Willamette Half Whittler in Mammoth that no buyer ever saw on their website. Beautiful matching covers. Let's take a look at that match. Oh yeah. Derek had a simple rule in place. The boys could cherry pick a Northwoods knife, set it aside untouched, until they were able to pay for it. The young gentleman explained to me over the phone how all too often the boys would take their sweet time on actually paying for a knife set aside for them and other knives as much as a year later <laughs> would cause them to change their minds about paying for the previous cherry pick knife and so they would quietly relist the knife. Folks, when and if this happens a superior example of a Northwoods or a GEC knife will suddenly appear and it'll just sit there like a wallflower. Back when I was buying up so many of these knives, I would check and recheck the inventories of every dealer. I made it a point to do this every week and you'd be surprised at how many stellar examples I stumbled across and purchased. This stunning half Whittler is the best example of them all. Looking for that special GEC made knife that you missed out on? Or trying to fill in holes of your existing collection? I can't promise that you'll find that special knife, but sometimes this method pays off in a spectacular way. Sure, they appear in this manner for few and far between among the dealers. However, when you land on one, you are not paying the inflated prices on the secondary market. Greg of TSA Knives and Barry of Gunstock Jacks buy GEC knives at shows and list them. Food for thought. Greg of TSA Knives also buys collections and quite often those collections are comprised of GEC knives still in mint condition with tubes and certificates of authenticity. I've acquired several prime examples from Greg this way. Now getting back to the Willamette Half Whittler. <clears throat> 
I almost forgot to mention the fact that this is one of the very few patterns that Bill Howard never produced for his own trademark knives. It was a Northwoods exclusive. This is such a historic and usable pattern that Bill should rerun them as GEC branded knives. The traditional knife community deserves it. Now Bill tried to talk Derek into going with rat tail bolsters, but Derek declined. Can you imagine how beautiful this knife would be with those? It would be a classic touch for sure. Now Bill had already designed the knife, then offered to Derek. Now, just so you guys know, this pattern with the Warncliffe mane on a cam tang and the pen secondary also on a cam tang is a blade set this pattern has never been manufactured in by GEC for GEC. However, do you recognize it? Yeah, it's a 38. So it was made in the Grinling Whitler, the 38 Special with that sort of Randall style clip, and the John Chapman budding and pruning knife, or the Farmer Jack, with the Hawkbill main and that sort of goofy space secondary. And Charlie Campania did an SFO and the Farmer Jack with rat tail bolsters. So all those components do exist if Bill would ever like to take, take up Steve's offer or suggestion on a GEC half Whitler on the 38 frame. Hmm, interesting. Well, that, guys, sort of does it for our Derek Bone tribute portion of tonight's video. We've got one very interesting Great Eastern Cutlery knife to talk about. <clears throat> Comes in this tube. I love that green titty script. The knife we're talking about is the number 153213L in Cocoa Bolo Wood. Where's the knife? Here's the knife. The number 15 electrician knife. This has an interesting story. Let's see what Steve has to say. Speaking of patterns that need to be run again, the number 153213L is one hot item. Talk about a sweet little work knife. And because it's a true work knife, it was only released under the Tidiute line. Folks, this little knife is loaded with usable features. Sheep's foot main blade. But a titty with a cut swedge and a long pull in all satin on half stops. Okay. And then a drywall or sheetrock saw equipped with two wire strippers. One here and one here. And those are bevel cut and sharp just by the grind of the blade and then a flat screwdriver tip for switch and outlet covers plus not on the main blade but on the saw we have a liner lock which is what that thing needs doesn't it it also sports a proud pivot pin for added strength. So what Steve means by that, most pivot pins are peened in a conical shaped reamed hole and just by the taper of that hole and the peening it holds that pivot pin in place. But when you peen the proud pivot pin clear over the flat of the bolster you get even more strength and that's been done here it also has a relief notch in the handle to make the saw and screwdriver blade much easier to access and then also a lanyard hole and all steel construction no brass liners and even the bolsters are steel again lending strength to that proud pivot. This little gem appeared first 
says Steve, as an SFO for a gentleman named Steve Rice. Steve is a highly respected contractor and tradesman in his local area. Before Steve finalized his order with Bill Howard, he reached out to several other tradesmen to get their input on features they liked, wanted, and did not want for the perfect electrician's knife. Built on the number 15 frame, it's slightly smaller, thinner, and lighter than anything else like it made today. Note how they purposely omitted a factory bale. When using for push cut or saw or screwdriver, a bale would wear a blister in the palm of your hand. The push cut saw makes short work of sheetrock and causes the majority of gypsum dust to fall inside the wall to minimize making a mess. So what are we talking about? This saw does not cut on the draw, it cuts on the push. Again, making that liner lock pretty necessary. And it's going to force, if this is your sheetrock, this is the outside of the wall, this is the inside, it's going to force all the dust to the inside to minimize cleanup. Pretty cool. And it also provides a cleaner cut because a two-way or unidirectional saw causes rips, I think he means bi-directional, causes rips and tattered edges facing the inside of a room, whether it's sheetrock or wood paneling. So all the splintering is going to happen on the back side of the sheet. Steve Rice's SFO versions have OD green micarta handles uh, with 74 of them equipped with a sheep's foot main and another 74 equipped with a spear main. Enter into your YouTube search bar STR space EK working over sheetrock. And then you'll see a video from Steve's channel to witness him demonstrate how straight and clean the saw blade actually works. The STR space EK etched only on the blades of his SFO version, so we won't see it on this one. For his name, an electrician knife. Steve was overjoyed with the results of the entire knife and it smokes anything else available today. After Steve's SS, SFOs were finished, GEC made their own versions identical, except that GEC versions were as follows. 21 produced in Knife Bright Acrylic, 28 with Coca Bolo Wood, which this one has, and another 28 in Ebony. All of the GEC versions came only with the Sheep's Foot Master Blade, and there's a note here on the side, and the Saw Screwdriver Blade, of course, but he just means they weren't available with the spear main. Mine has the Coca Bolo handles, Steve says, and oddly enough, the ebony versions are much lighter in color than the Coca Bolo. If I didn't tell you this was Coca Bolo, you would have thought this was one of the ebony knives. That is deep, deep, deep red. The ebony knives don't look like ebony at all. All produced back in 2013 and with such low production totals. Do you think they need to run this gem again? I'm thinking they do. Steve says, you bet they do. I bought only this one when very few were left. Right away I wanted another one to EDC. But like most hot GEC patterns, they were gone. So I've been waiting all this time, hoping they run them again. I'm going to wait another year, he says. If they don't, I'm putting this one to work. Believe that. Okay, guys, this is the last knife we're going to talk about tonight. And... He wrote a book about this one. So if you need to pause the video, go get something cold to drink. Make sure that you got your jammies on and don't have any uncomfortable shoes because it's going to be a while. Ready? The last knife in tonight's video, the original R7493 Remington Whitler. Steve says, last but certainly not least, Let's examine a truly old knife made by one of the heaviest hitters in American cutlery history. It's the R7493 Remington Split Back Whittler. At only 3 and 3 8 inches long, closed. This is as small as I like to go with a knife, but there's a lot going on in such a small frame. But first thing first, let's date this knife. Due to the company's history, 
and the fact that they used a limited variety of tank stamps. This knife, along with their other quality knives, can only be narrowed down to years of production from 1920 to 1932, according to the books. So this knife is anywhere from 88 to 100 years old and made during a time when the quality was top priority. More on their history and eventual troubles a little later. But <clears throat> for such a small Whittler, this gem has incredibly large secondary blades in both length and thickness. So let's just take a look. Let's get the main blade out of the way and take a look at these secondaries. Look how long that pen blade is. And he's right, it's not thin. And then we've got a little mini clip. Uh -huh. Both secondaries reach the center of the federal shield. My only complaint is they should have swapped the position of the secondaries because the little clip point blade makes accessing the master blade a little tricky. Let's see what he means. Ah. Uh, See, if that were a pen blade, where that spine sort of swooped down, we'd have better access to the nail neck. So, uh, I guess I could agree, but, you know, it kind of gives you a prying surface. So, I don't know. It's also one of the rarer Whittlers equipped with two clip point blades, the main and one of the secondaries, and steel liners that are jeweled. So what I think Steve means is that the edges of the liners are coined. And if I can get the light to reflect correctly for you, the steel liners are going to look like the edge of a pocket-worn quarter. I hope you can see that. I hope it's picking that up. And that, that coining is only along the spine of the handle. This Whittler also has near sunken joints. So what does that mean? When the knife is closed and you run your finger over the profile you can barely feel the blade tang protrude. Makes it very pocket friendly. Check out those tobacco brown bone covers with extensive pocket wear. Yeah, that's genuine pocket wear. Not like a new modern case pocket worn, but this is worn by an actual pocket. You can't buy that look. The knife and its owner have to earn it through decades of use and carry. Not a single hairline crack anywhere in that bone, not even at the pins. But it does have a tiny chip in the bone on the front cover. Let's see if we can find it. Upper right next to the large bolster. There it is. Right between in the corner by the liner. See it? The rear cover also has a tiny chip. Bottom right near the small bolster. There it is. <clears throat> I suspect a knife has probably been dropped a time or two, perhaps on a wood floor, because no scars can be seen on the bolsters. These bone covers are also incredibly thin. And yes, they are. The thinnest I've ever seen on any knife. Both clip blades are near full, meaning not having been sharpened much or ever tipped. There's the main. And there's the secondary. Ironically, it's the pen blade that saw the most use. And I kind of noticed that when we pulled it out before. Quite a bit of material has been removed from the belly area of that, or that pen blade. No half stops anywhere on the knife, even though Remington used half stops on many of their knives. But guys, a lot of Whittlers over the last 150 years were made on cam tangs, and these are beautiful. The blades still have good snap, and the master blade is like a mini bear trap. This is one tough little whittler. 
The federal shield is pinned, and although it is inlaid into the bone, they left it rather proud. And it's probably a little hard to tell how proud it was when it was new, because the bone would have pocket-worn more than the shield, I suspect. Many, of it, uh, many, if not most, of the old factories did this on purpose to make the shield appear more prominent to the eye. However, all the wood handle knives by all the makers came with flesh-mounted shields. Steve says, note how the end cap bolsters are rather elliptical where they meet the bone covers versus straight across like modern traditional folders. He's right, they are a little bit elliptical. Many of the old factories did this, and I can only surmise that it was a process that aided in a tighter seam between bolster and cover, sort of the same principle as a dovetail joint. Check out the downright peculiar position of the blades inside the blade well. Now this is going to be a little hard to see, but we will. And how the main blade is set diagonally, much like a Congress knife. See that? It looks crooked. The point of the main blade even rides against the rear secondary blade. Guys, this is not a mistake in production. And once we examine the grinds of all three blades as a complete set, we can see how this is intentional. The main blade has asymmetrical grinds. And looking at how it runs along the front blade, it's literally impossible for that main blade to be set in straight. Why? Examine the bottom of the knife. Note how it has a subtle yet graceful wishbone shape to the liners, meaning they don't split straight. They start parallel and then they come out like a wishbone with a curve. So that center spacer has a compound taper. It is not a straight line. Hold the knife so the double end faces the camera and then sight down the bottom and you can literally see how the whole frame has that wishbone shape in a very subtle way. It all starts with that center spacer from the double end. It remains the same thickness for about an inch. So about that far. Then it begins to taper rapidly. But once it re reaches the shield, so about here, the taper angle, sh angle shallows out and it runs into nothing. This begs the question. This construction method seems like it causes major lateral tension on the springs. So, does only two tiny pins keep the knife from flying apart? Or are their springs pre-shaped? I have no idea, but it is fancy and quite trick. None of GEC's whittlers have this wishbone construction. However, Bill's whittlers have a perfect symmetrical blade positioning when they're closed. Many old splitback whittlers are made like this Remington, and if, they're ground in, if they ground and position the blades to be in a perfect symmetrical position like Bill Howard's are, then there, they would be rather unsightly, open gaps in the blade well between each secondary blade and the liners. <clears throat> Which obviously this knife does not have. At least several of the bigger old factories made close to a hundred different whittlers alone. Just whittlers, a hundred different ones. So you can bet that many old whittlers were also made the way Bill Howard produces his now. Perhaps Bill or Tony Bowes could tell us if these old wishbone shaped whittlers have springs that are pre-shaped laterally. Note how the main blade runs off to the side when open, really, when open? Let's see, does it? I'll be doggone. It sure does. And the swedge grinds make it look crooked. 
as we sight down the spine. The rear swedge is ground flat, but the front swedge has a convex grind. So here's the front convex ground swedge, and here's the rear flat swedge. Pretty cool. This allows more meat in the blade for the nail neck. Uh -huh. Convex. More meat for the nail neck. But aside from the slight recurve along the cutting edge due to moderate blade wear and sharpening, that main blade grind is dead on when laid against the stone. Note how one secondary blade has a regular kick while the other has a hidden kick. Let's see. So there's your standard kick on the clip point. And then there's a hidden kick, meaning the kick is clear back almost in the frame. See? On the pen blade. Nearly all of the old companies did this with certain whittlers, especially balloon or swell center whittlers. I have other splitbacks made with different kicks on each secondary. I have no idea why this was customary, and it remains a mystery because none of the books discuss it. Here's something else that's surprising about this knife. If you take away the handful of Remington trappers, lockbacks, and a few other large sporting knives, this pattern holds a rather high value in mint condition. The aforementioned trappers and sporting knives value at thousands of dollars, but according to the official price guide by, the C, by C. Houston Price, 15th edition printed in 2008, this exact Whittler with bone is valued at $400 mint, that puts it in the upper 15% of Remington's entire catalog. Must be a rare pattern, Steve says. Now compared to other cutlery companies, the story about Remington's knife history is rather short and simple. The year was 1816 when Eli Remington forged his first gun barrel in Indian Gulch, New York. He named his company E. Remington and Sons. Soon thereafter, the Erie Canal was constructed and Remington moved his successful company near there. Fast forward to 1867 when one of the world's largest sporting good companies known as Shiler, Hartley & Graham had purchased two ammunition manufacturers, consolidated them, and renamed the whole shooting match the Union Metallic Cartridge Company. Now, in 1888, this giant purchased E. Remington & Sons and renamed it the Remington Arms Company. Then in 1912, the parent company combined Remington and Union and shortened the name to Remington UMC and moved <laughs> to Burlington, Connecticut. During World War I, Remington had begun making bayonets for the military, in addition to supplying them with firearms. By the time World War I ended, Remington UMC found itself in the same situation as Winchester. Both had enormous manufacturing facilities now sitting near idle and plenty of investment capital, so both found entering the cutlery business as the obvious choice. It's interesting to note how each approached the cutlery field in two entirely different ways. Winchester chose to purchase two existing cutlery companies, plus partnered with Shapley Hardware, who also owned the Walden Knife Company. However, Remington chose a more grassroots approach. They chose to start from basically scratch. The production of pocket knives began in 1920. Only a year later, they had over 2,000 dealers throughout most of the country. And by 1930, they were at peak production, totaling 3 million knives per year in nearly, are you kidding me, 1,000 patterns. Take away weekends and holidays, and that comes to around 10,000 knives per day. From 1920 to this point, the quality was outstanding as all of these knives were stamped with the famous Remington UMC inside a circle and on larger tangs made in the USA. Let's see if we can find the tang stamp. There is the model number. 
and there is the Remington UMC tang stamp. All three blades of this Whittler have these stamps, but notice how the stamps appear on both secondary blades only on the pile side of the knife, regardless of which side the nail neck's located. So there's the pile side of the pen blade. And there's the pile side of the clip. Most of the old cutlery companies did it this way as well, which kind of tells me that they used a lot of the same blades in different knives and swapped them from side to side, so they stamped them one way. The Great Depression took its toll on most of America's cutlery companies, and that included Remington, as well as distributors and dealers for all knife makers from that era. In 1933, controlling interests in the company was sold to E.I. DuPont. By 1936, two-thirds of their entire knife catalog was dropped. The quality of the remaining knife patterns dropped as well. These lower quality knives also lost the famous tang stamps inside of a circle and were replaced with only the name Remington in a straight line. By 1940, Remington sold its entire cutlery division, including all equipment, parts, and supplies, to the PAL PAL Blade Company. How ironic is it that Remington and Winchester were both heralded as two of the most famous cutlery companies from the 20th century, yet each lasted only 20 years as actual knife manufacturers. Both started and ended for the same reasons, World War I ending led them into making knives, and the Great Depression brought both companies financial troubles. But World War II would bring new opportunities to concentrate most of their efforts on firearms production to support the war effort. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. As I was getting close to completing this written information, I stumbled across and purchased a couple more antique knives that are not only much older than anything we've presented yet in this series, but they are the most beautiful, with one of them being the finest in precision and craftsmanship I've ever seen in this pattern. Among all of the cutlery companies in history, what is it? You'll have to wait until we present it here, providing Rob approves making another video soon after this one. Yeah, twist my arm, buddy. Uh, these old knives do exhibit some wear, <laughs> but man are they gorgeous. I'm already done with all the research and ready to go. Thank you, and God bless you all. Hope to see you soon. And we thank you, Steve, we certainly do, for bringing these historical artifacts, works of art, and awesome knives to us. Let's not forget Derek's stuff as we fade to black, shall we? There's Big Maddie. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And a little Willamette. I don't own a Willamette, guys. What is wrong with me? What is wrong with me? Mm. That's all for this one. Grace to you and peace, my friends, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, the word is sharp. Y'all have a great day, evening, morning, whatever it is when this video finds you. Talk to you soon.